and hepatitis, um, this kind of liver failure cycle can start. Um, bacterial infections are the most common trigger um, for acute liver failure. Um, portal hypertension is another cause of that. Um, you can get thrombosis, um, especially, you know, as um, when patients' um, liver starts to fail, um, it becomes more and more difficult to, um, to create some of the, some of the um, clotting factors. Um, and you can get a decrease in gluconeogenesis. Um, so patients can become hypoglycemic. Um, you can get a decrease in lactic clearance, um, such as um, with, like kind of showing like a metabolic acidosis. Um, and you can also get a um, decrease in ammonia clearance here. Let's see what else comes next. So acute liver failure, the treatment of that is pretty complicated. Um, again, you may you want the patients here are hyperperfused and vasodilated, um, and so um, patients generally re um, require blood products for um, bleeding patients with liver failure who are in shock. So you, you can fluid resuscitate with normal saline um, in the non-bleeding um, liver failure patient. Um, you can consider um, IV albumin in patients who have hepatorenal syndrome or um, hepatic encephalopathy, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Um, you want to give fluid resuscitation. You can consider giving albumin, especially if the patients um, have, have recently had a paracentesis. Um, and you want to um, have a very low threshold for initiating antibiotics um, in patients with acute liver failure, especially if you suggest, if it looks like an infection may be a trigger. Um, you know, patients with liver failure frequently have hypoglycemia. Um, and so you want to make sure that we're giving um, those patients plenty of sugar um, through like a D10 or a D25 um, maintenance effusion or a D50 bolus because patients with acute liver failure are not able to do their own gluconeogenesis. So sometimes their sugar drops very low and we have to supplement all of that. Um, hyper, um, ammonia levels can be elevated as well, um, but patients with um, liver failure generally have um, elevated ammonia levels regardless if that's the cause of their symptoms. So they really should be treated for that as well using lactulose and um, Rickfem, uh, sigmin. Um, so here's an example of the different, this is the clotting pathway, which we've all learned about um, a little bit, that basically shows the different factors that are going, that um, contribute to the, um, both the intrinsic and the extrinsic clotting pathways. And we're going to talk about in the next slide why that's important. Um, so patients with cirrhosis and liver disease are at higher risk of thrombosis than hemorrhage, which, which is, can sometimes be a very... Um, can be an interesting um, point. So for example, just when patients with liver failure have elevated INR, that does not mean patients will have a pulmonary, um, it doesn't mean they can't have a pulmonary embolism or a portal vein thrombosis. And the reason for that is because factors two, seven, nine, and 10 are reduced um, and that, can, that increases the risk of bleeding. Um, however, um, proteins S and C are also reduced, which increases the risk of clotting. Um, so basically, the hypothesis that um, a lot of liver doctors have right now is that lower serum albumin concentrations um, can is a is kind of an indication that the liver is not making enough proteins um, overall, and that includes protein C and S. And when proteins S and C are low, that increases risk of clotting. So patients with a um, high INR can still form blood clots. Um, especially if the albumin is low, um, patients can be an increased risk for thromboembolic events. Um, and cirrhosis also increases the risk of bleeding from esophageal or gastric varices if a patient is anticoagulated.
We'll talk a little bit about the portal vein here. Um, the portal vein here is formed between the splenic and superior mesenteric veins um, that drain the spleen um, and the small intestines, which we can see right here. This is where the portal vein is right here. A portal vein thrombosis is a clot in the portal vein. Um, the presentation here includes patients. Um, patients can be asymptomatic. Um, they can have abdominal pain, um, a GI bleed. The physical exam can be pretty variable. Um, some patients will, you know, they can be, um, they can have pain there. Um, they can have some tenderness. Um, the labs are generally considered pretty nonspecific. Um, CT scan um, with contrast or a Doppler abdominal ultrasound is considered the, uh, the best um, imaging tool to check for portal vein thrombosis. Um, and one of the complications here includes um, intestinal ischemia. So in uh, treatment for portal vein thrombosis um, includes you want to evaluate for any bleeding risk. And sometimes you may have to consult GI for an endoscopy um, to check for varices. Um, you sometimes can consider um, ceftriaxone for spontaneous bacterial um, peritonitis prophylactically. Um, and for anticoagulation, you want a hematology consultation. And it usually involves using low mo molecular weight heparin. Um, as long as the platelets are above 50,000 and the fibrinogen um, is um, okay, you can generally consider giving um, anticoagulation for these patients. Um, you can do other prophylaxis um, for the varices, such as beta blockers or ligation of the um, esophageal varices. And the reason we're, we tend to use low molecular weight heparin is because the APTT is generally prolonged um, at baseline in patients with liver disease, and that can make monitoring unfractionated heparin very difficult. And um, patients um, generally have a very variable INR as well, which makes um, monitoring warfarin very difficult. Um, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is another um, very common condition in patients with cirrhosis. Um, the presentation here includes ascites, um, like fluid in the abdomen, fever, abdominal pain, altered mental status, hypotension, fatigue, and malice. Um, the, it can also include sepsis, leukocytosis, renal failure, and hypothermia. Um, you know, it's it's really um, diagnosed by um, doing a paracentesis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the diagnosis is for polymorphonuclear um, PMNs greater than 250 cells per cc. Um, and if the patient is, is on dialysis, the diagnostic criteria are a little bit different. It's greater than 100 cells per cc with greater than 50% neutrophils. Um, some other common um, diagnostic findings for SPP, including a serum, ascites, albumin um, gradient greater than 1.1, um, a protein level less than 1, and a glucose level greater than 50. Um, you, you know, some of the labs that after we do the paracentesis, there's a number of different labs we can check, including a cell count with differential, a gram stain, um, a culture, glucose, protein, albumin, LDH, amylase, and TB. Um, you also want to do a CT scan um, for patients um, with any kind of um, ascites in their belly um, to check for any secondary causes of bacterial peritonitis, including a bowel perforation or an intra-abdominal abscess. Um, in patients with a secondary bacterial um, peritonitis, um, that can use, um, protein is usually greater than one and glucose is less than 50. So it's a little bit of an opposite of what we see in um, compared to the spontaneous condition. Um, you know, the treatment for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis includes early antibiotics, um, such as given a third generation cephalosporin, including ceftriaxone um, at 25 milligrams per kilogram, up to about two grams a day, um, or cefotoxime at 25 milligrams per kilogram every eight hours. Um, you do want to consider antibiotic prophylaxis, um, especially um, once you have diagnosed a patient with um, SBP. Um, they sometimes go on um, antibiotic prophylaxis um, on a kind of daily regimen after they've been diagnosed. 
Um, you can um, give albumin 1.5 grams per kilogram within the first six hours and another gram per kilogram um, on day three. Um, and the indications for that include um, serum creatinine um, greater than one, um, a B1 greater than 30, or a total bilirubin greater than four. Um, and this basically, um, this has been uh, found in a, in a study about um, almost 20 years ago now um, that showed a 25% reduction in renal failure and a 20% reduction in mortality. Um, a paracentesis, we can perform if the INR is less than eight and the platelet count is greater than 20,000. Um, and so when we're performing a paracentesis, we see where the inferior epigastric artery is, um, and we want to find the spot there. So we want to palpate where the um, anterior superior iliac spine is, go down three centimeters and go to the right three centimeters so that we're avoiding the inferior epigastric artery. Um, and here's an example of how ultrasound can be very helpful when we're doing um, a paracentesis. So right now, you can use the curvilinear probe or the linear probe. Right here, what we see is we see the abdominal wall. We see the ascites, the fluid inside the belly. And this is the fluid that we want to get a sample of. And we see the bowel as well. So the reason this is very helpful is we don't want to push a needle through the abdominal wall and hit the um, hit the, the bowel there because that can lead to a bowel perforation. And so by using ultrasound, we can see our needle going through the abdominal wall here into the belly and drawing off a sample of the acidic fluid here. And you can watch your needle to make sure it doesn't hit the bowel to reduce your chance of leading to a bowel perforation. This is a really good example about of, of the uh, what we call the Z-track technique. So when you puncture the bowel, um, if you just stick the needle in and you pull it out, you're basically leaving a hole there. And that can sometimes lead to leaking of the acidic fluid inside the belly. Um, and so what a, a good way to go about it is you can you can start here first, where you slide this skin down a little bit before you puncture. And then you go all the way to inside the belly, as you can see here, then they have pulled the skin down about two centimeters. They're puncturing through and they're inserting the needle here to draw off the fluid. But when they release it, when they release the skin, the two holes are no longer directly next to each other. They have, they are moved apart and that prevents um, uh, acidic fluid from leaking from the belly after you have done the paracentesis. Um, there are a couple other diagnostic, um, condi um, different condition, uh, diagnosis of exclusion we can talk about briefly today. Um, one of them is hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so this is, again, a diagnosis of an exclusion. Um, it is an um, accumulation of nitrogenous waste product normally metabolized by the liver. So because patients with cirrhosis and liver failure have difficulty metabolizing a lot of the nitrogen waste, it can accumulate and cause patients to have altered mental status. Um, the increase, there's an increase in metabolism of the ammonia that has accumulated into glutamine in the central nervous system. Um, and when we're treating these patients, we want to rule out other causes of altered mental status. Um, some of the common causes of hepatic encephalopathy include um, medications, um, electrolyte abnormalities, um, dehydration, um, or sepsis. Um, lactulose can help reduce the elevated ammonia levels, and we want to replace the patient's fluid and albumin. Um, if there's any type of um, hypokalemia, we want to treat that because it's um, believed that hypokalemia can contribute to um, elevated ammonia levels by decreasing ammonia excretion. Um, we want to be very cautious to be um, to to see if patients have um, any form of cerebral edema, um, and if patients do have that, 
we want to increase the head of the bed above by 45 degrees. Um, and you can give patients um, hypertonic saline to increase um, the um, serum sodium to 145 to 150. I mean, again, um, breakfast salmon um, is not absorbed in the gut, and this can eradic help eradicate E. coli, um, which produces ammonia. This is considered a long-term therapy that we can use. Another diagnosis of exclusion here is hepatorenal syndrome. Um, and this is a diagnosis of exclusion with a mortality rate of greater than 50%. Um, it includes acute renal failure, which is seen as a complication of cirrhosis. And what happens here is that there's changes in systemic and splanchnic circulations, leading to severe renal vasoconstriction. Um, in hepatorenal syndrome, um, the presentation includes decreased urine output, um, elevated creatinine, low urine sodium, minimal urine protein, and renal function and volume status that do not improve with fluids and albumin. Um, the diagnosis here, the diagnosis here includes cirro uh, patients with cirro uh, cirrhosis with ascites, a creatinine greater than 1.49, no improvement in creatinine after withdrawing diuretics and providing albumin, absence of shock and nephrotoxic medications, and the absence of parenchymal renal disease. Um, and so the treatment for hepatorenal syndrome includes avoiding diuretics and benzos. Um, if patients are found to have low albumin, we do want to replace their albumin um, with um, IV replacement at 1.5 grams per kilo. Uh, we want to consider norepinephrine as a medication for the hypotension, um, which can likely be caused by vasodilation. We um, want to consider octreotide, um, which is which antagonizes the splanchnic vasodilators that we see um, formed in hepatorenal syndrome. And we can consider another medication such as um, minodrine, um, which is an alpha agonist to increase systemic uh, vasoconstriction. Um, so these conditions are not very common, but they're all something that we can um, consider in order to ensure that, you know, our patients are, are getting the treatment that they need, um, especially when they have any form of liver failure going on. Um, that is all that we have here. Um, any questions that we can, that anyone wants to talk about or answer, um, you can say it out loud, we can put it in the chat. Um, you know, all of those are, are you know, work, work just fine. Thank you, Dai. Th thank you, Dai. Thank you for coming. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, we see it. Yeah, we see it pretty. Uh, you know, it's definitely common. A lot of patients who have, um, you know, any kind of, especially patients who use alcohol, um, that can be. It's very, you know, it's very common to see them with, um, with you know, alcohol cirrhosis. Oh, yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> it is. It is. It is very. It is. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Interesting. Thank you. That that's very uh, that's very. I, I do you know it's a lot. A lot of it's like using the methanol poisoning. A lot of it's toxicology. But we get you know we can definitely talk about that as well. You know, in terms of the alcohol use and sometimes when you drink you know methanol, you can get like the anion gap that usually kind of clues us into why why someone has that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we. Next week and the following week, and then we're off at the end of the month for tech. Sounds good. Okay. Any if anyone has any other questions, you're welcome. You know, you can email us or put it in the chat, and we can talk more, more about it there as well. Yeah. Thank you, Dai. Bye.